I've got one that can see. So you've decided which ACOG model you want, but you can't decide which reticle to commit to. I pulled out a few of my ACOGs to discuss the pros and cons of each reticle. From left to right, I have an original RCO M4 Red Chevron, a green horseshoe dot, the ACSS from Primary Arms, a Gen 2 ECOS Red Crosshair, a standard green crosshair, a Gen 1 ECOS green crosshair, a black only crosshair TA01 NSN, a Marine Corps TA11 SDO 3.5 green horseshoe, and another TA01, whoa, wait, you're not supposed to see this one yet. After these models, I have a surprise reticle, so stick around to see which one. A quick disclaimer before moving on. All reticle footage imposed onto living creatures in this video was done with the optic removed from the weapon using a camera mount for safety. All other footage while mounted was done at a shooting range under safe conditions. Before we talk about the reticles, let's first try to answer a common question. Which color? Green or red, you ask? Well, the short answer is both work. You may have heard that green can blend into green environments, and that's partially true, but not like you may think. To explain, let's start with some lighting conditions. The fiber optic on an ACOG has the ability to draw in so much sunlight that outdoors you can see the green just fine over green plant life. Occasionally, you'll hit an area so bright from reflection that it may hide the bright green reticle, but it's not common, and in real life, I can still make out the reticle, even though the camera can't. Red obviously stands out on green as well, especially under fiber illumination, but two factors contribute to green working just fine in vegetation. If we take both green and red color spectrums, you can see that both have a darker variant of themselves. Dark green or forest green and dark red or maroon are equal shades of one another. As we slide down the color spectrum, we get to the midpoint, again equals of one another. After this, we must add white or even yellow to brighten the color up to its lighter value, but wait. Why did my red turn orange and pink? Well, that's because there is no light version of red. It becomes two different color hues, where green can become more of a mint or lime green while still being green in color. This means a green reticle has the ability to get much brighter as far as our eyesight and perception of color goes. This is crucial to understand color choice, so now let's talk about some lighting conditions that affect our color choice. The four positions you'll encounter are dark areas into light areas, light into dark, dark into dark, and light into light areas. Up first is dark into light. Shooting from a low light position into a light area dims the reticle down and shades back to our dark red and dark green shade. Well, now we have a problem. This darker shade of green does start to disappear into our vegetation, but this dark red kind of does as well. Shooting from a dark position into a light position is the Achilles heel of the fiber optic ACOG model. Even the amber reticle under dark condition goes back to a shade more like a brownish golden color that doesn't like to play nice. Brown, maroon, and forest green are all natural tones that tend to blend themselves in when shooting from a darker position into a light position. Everyone has different terrain features and colors depending on where they live. If I could pick only one color that would be used in all terrains, like a jungle, desert, fall woods, or urban areas, with the dark color tone of each reticle, it would be red. The maroon seems to be found the least amount in nature compared to greens and browns, which ironically is the two most used colors in camouflage. Amber in its dark brown tone doesn't play well in these environments. The darker green doesn't play well either in these heavy green areas or sections of urban areas where green is still present. Maroon can make itself the most useful in these terrains with a small bit of trouble in the fall brown season, still better than the brown from the amber reticle. Maroon is the least likely to wash away in these four color terrains while shooting from a dark position. You'd think maroon is closer to brown, thus performing poor in the fall woods, but surprisingly the green actually performs worse in comparison. The good news is that all three colors can be dimmed down all the way back to black by taping off the fiber on top. A black only reticle shooting from a dark into a light position solves this problem altogether since black can be seen on top of any terrain color avoiding this completely so color may not matter here, but let's not go there just yet. Back to our lighting conditions, we have a light position into a dark position. Light in the dark area seems like a non-issue, although the blooming can be so strong, it could cover the fine details of a target, which we'll talk about more in a bit. If we look at our color spectrums, red is a dark to mid color set because it's no longer red in the brighter range. Amber is the opposite, being a light to mid range color since it becomes a new color brown in the dark half of its spectrum. And green has a full dark to light color range, one of the main reasons it was selected for night vision. Since both green and amber have a brighter top end range, they will bloom and cover the most while shooting from a light position into a dark position compared to red, but don't be fooled. Red also gets insane bright. 
The blooming will make it hard to see what someone may be doing if they're in a dark position, and even harder if they're further back in a room like a sniper's hide. Here again, we might consider the one thing they all have in common, a black version. This may sound counterintuitive at first, a black reticle into a dark area, but this actually works quite well. Here my camera doesn't quite capture how good you can see the black reticle over the dark area, so I'll impose a fake image over the picture to represent what I'm seeing. The reticle is very dark and crisp, and I have no problem reading the BTC information over the dark room in the back. Black is rarely found in nature unless it's night out, but we're shooting from a light position. Even if shooting into a lower light position at a black t-shirt, you can see the black reticle just fine. Well, let's take a photo still and put it into a color select tool. What we perceive as black actually turns out to be more of a gray tone under light. Even as I approach to a closer distance, the shirt is never a true black like the reticle that's enclosed inside of the egg hog housing. Even if we color select a dark doorway or window, it's not a true black unless it's after nightfall, but we'll get to that situation later. Also, the further away a color is in the distance, the more blurry and faint it becomes. This is called atmospheric perspective. These lush green trees in the distance start to take on more of a bluish hue the further back they are, when we know they're actually green. Under the ocean, where it's much darker, we can see atmospheric perspective taking effect on sea life and terrain in the distance. This is why a black reticle will serve you just fine during daylight hours, even shooting into a darker position. Even at sunset, there's a small window from where the reticle is hard to see until the internal tritium kicks in. The fiber and non-fiber models have an internal tritium lamp to take over when night falls, but the TAO2 LED model will have to be turned on manually since it doesn't include the internal tritium lamp. This brings us to lighting condition 3, dark into dark. Although we can't see very far in the dark, the color of the reticle doesn't matter much in this scenario. The tritium illumination isn't nearly as bright as the fiber illumination is. The main problem here is the clothing color of the target. If they're wearing white, you should have no problem acquiring a good point of aim. If they're wearing black, it may be hard to guarantee a good point of aim on target, regardless of the reticle. You could just hit them with the white light instantly, turning the reticle black in this dark-to-dark -dark situation, including indoors. If this threat was exposed to urban lighting, they may lose advantage they had in the darker shadows, and under night vision, you're just screwed anyway. The tritium is dim enough to take a precise shot under passive night vision if you use a higher mount like the Unity Tactical COG mount. If you're interested in this, go check out my video. The LED models don't include tritium, so you'll have to select an appropriate brightness. And the fiber model, be careful. If you yourself walk under urban lighting, the reticle may bloom on you, blowing out the reticle and your point of aim. In total darkness, with no moon, this passive option is basically a waste of time because the background is too dark to make out a threat, and all you'll see is a bright glowing reticle in your nods. This blooming under nods covers your point of aim and renders the ACOG quite a mess to use, which brings us to the final lighting condition. Light into light. Green may be the brightest color to our eye and brain, but this can also be a problem when combined with the right colors. On this sunny day, we can see green performing quite well against the greens. In an urban overwatch, some of the atmospheric perspective takes over and the green works just fine. Now as I do some make-believe recon across this river, you can see that the lighter golden brown tan color of the water seems to digest the green reticle like an herbivore. Even to my eye in person, this reticle did a strange disappearing act on me. There are strange colors that absorb this green even at max illumination. If we leave nature for a bit and pan across an industrial zone, anything that is bright or similar in color to our river tan colors, the green can play funny games. Red seems to fare pretty well in this industrial zone even though some of the rust-like browns could raise concerns. Amber might play similar games to green with its brighter abilities over white and brown color while dim, but I had to let Amber go. Going back to this shed, let's compare the performance of green and red against a white backing to see what happens. Green also doesn't like to play well against white in bright conditions, which also has to do with how bright it gets compared to red, which can't go as bright in its color spectrum. Red doesn't wash out against white as bad as the green does in its full lighting conditions. To wrap up color selection, just know that green comes with stronger pros and cons than red does. When it's good, it's good, and when it's bad, it's bad. I personally think that red is the safer bet as an all-terrain color. It can be seen in more terrain circumstances than green can, and in all four lighting scenarios considered. Again, you can always tape off the fiber on top and run each color black, which performed well in all lighting conditions. I actually find myself running black reticles most of the time. The ACOG illumination hasn't really given me much of an advantage during daylight hours. You may be able to pick it up a bit quicker in a pinch if you have the illumination, but a little practice, the black reticle works just fine. After all, this isn't exactly a close quarter optic anyway. With a target inside of 25 yards, there's a good chance the magnification could slow you down just trying to confirm your sight picture on target. 
Whether I have illumination on or not, you can see the brightest reticle against the darkest reticle doesn't make much of a difference regardless of the target lighting, even with a black shirt on. As I get closer to the sight picture, I obviously get larger, which increases the probability of getting a hit. You can't go wrong with any of these reticle colors, just know that I think red is probably the most universal color. Now that you know which color may be best for you, we need to get to the real topic, which is reticle design. Reticle selection is the hardest part when buying an ACOG, more so than color choice. This isn't exactly a cheap optic to some, so let's break this down into two categories. CQB first, and then mid-range shooting. Depending on which model you've decided on, you may not have every possible reticle Trigicon has to offer, but don't worry. Reticles like the donut, the single dot, and the triangle aren't really optimal compared to the main three we all know. The chevron, the horseshoe dot, and the old school crosshair. The not so common reticles don't really use the full potential of an ACOG, which is the reason we want one in the first place. If you have calibers like 300 Blackout and 308, you might be forced into a specific reticle because not all designs are available. Starting from a close quarter standpoint, let's see how they perform getting a quick sight acquisition. I'm going to break the reticles I have into three families. The crosshairs, the horseshoes, which I classify the standard ACSS as a horseshoe dot reticle, even though it has a small chevron in place of the dot, and last the chevron group. You may have noticed earlier, I also have the surprise ACSS Aurora reticle designed by Primary Arms that is very popular, but also discontinued. I got lucky to have a friend that can find the unfindable, otherwise this video wouldn't be complete. Starting from a close quarter standpoint, let's see how they perform acquiring quick sight acquisition. We'll take one from each family of reticles at 10 feet, 15 yards, and then 25 yards to see if any have an advantage. At this close distance, especially using a 4x optic, a threat is so large I'm not sure you can miss with any of these reticles. To be honest, you can just point shoot this close much faster than using the optic. Here at 15 yards, the target size is so large, I don't think there's any reticle design advantage. You'd think that the larger chevron and horseshoe would be quicker, but the crosshair has quite a bit more illumination than you might have thought in comparison. Again, no real advantage. Out to 25 yards, the reticles are all inside of a silhouette sized target, and I personally don't see any type of speed advantage. The chevron may be the easiest to take a more precise shot at this distance, but again, using a 4x this close is already slow, and adding a precision shot like a tee box would waste too much time. By the time you acquire a sight picture, a red dot enjoyer would have already smoked you. What about the black reticle since it's done pretty well so far? Not having day illumination kinda sorta makes this a bit slower, but these thick black German crosshair posts actually guide you to center. A target this large at these close distances will basically be just as fast. In a slightly darker lighting, maybe not. If I had to give any edge to the best close range reticle, it'd have to be the chevron. Maybe from 25 to 100 yards on a moving target, I would say the chevron is probably the best, but again, the ACOG isn't exactly a close quarter optic. Where it does shine is from 100 to 500 yards. For this final section, let me remind you that all reticle footage on living creatures was filmed with the optic removed using a camera mount for safety. Let's start with the legacy chevron first. The military issue RCO, and then the ACSS Aurora. The chevron is probably the most well known of the three main designs. Fielded with the US Marine Corps and the US Army, this iconic reticle has plenty of nostalgia and time in use. This reticle is equipped with a fine aiming point for close quarter ranges which we just went over. This chevron tip shrinks to an infinitely small point of aim like a fractal, which is why it has both speed and accuracy up close. This is cool and all, but your eyes are not a microscope, so we cannot see infinitely small. If we add in the blooming under bright sunlight, this infinitely small aiming point becomes a much larger pain in the butt. This fuzzy tip, while illuminated, hides the fine tip of the black reticle under this glow. If we tape off the fiber on top, we can see the tip is actually hiding behind the glow right about here. This is why I always suggest zeroing with the fiber taped off. If you zero using the tip of the glow here, the lower half of the reticle will not impact where they're supposed to. This is where I can discuss my gripe with the Chevron. To those on Team Chevron who think this infinite point of aim is so good, why isn't there a Chevron at every aiming point on the BDC like the early Russian reticles? It's because the Chevron shape covers too much of the target at these distances to take a precise point of aim. And it makes you wonder why the lower section of the BDC is always a crosshair design. Imagine all of these Chevrons under bright illumination which gives you a false point of aim like we discussed, and now you can see the point I'm trying to make. We wouldn't use these for precision shots out to distance, which is why long-range shooters use thin black reticles, not chevrons. The chevron was the happy medium between a mid-range BDC optic that can still be used in a pinch at close-quarter distances inside of 100 meters with this sharp point of aim. 
This 1.1 MOA thick chevron covers 3.3 inches on a target at 300 yards if it's taped off, and expands covering more at 300 at full brightness. This blooming deceives your true point of aim since it expands an additional 3 inches or so in each direction, covering much more of your target compared to the black reticle. Now you may not have noticed the hidden threat behind cover in the green to the left of the white target here. Most people demonstrate these reticles over large solid color targets in the open giving you a false sense of reality using the ACOG. This green threat behind cover is more realistic and a low probability shot is where the chevron falls apart. This 300 point of aim under the blooming again gives you a false sense of aim because the point of impact is actually here, not here. On top of that, the glow expansion under the chevron with the 300 post also expanding starts to close in this little pocket where we need to see the most on this reduced size threat. Without a generous silhouette to guide us to center, we basically have a head and shoulder to work with. When we move to line up our point of aim on target, this blooming restricts our precision on top of the false point of aim from the glow. I usually come up from the side to gauge my elevation and then move left onto center to minimize any error for this type of shot, or hope I have some tape handy to remove the glow back to a black reticle, opening up this center area. If you think I'm picking on the thick blooming, just ask yourself why we turn down our red dots not only to zero, but also to take precision shots out to distance. A smaller dot doesn't cover as much of the target. Early issued red dots had six MOA dots, which got replaced with two MOA red dots and one MOA holographics because large dots cover too much of the target, just like this chevron at distance. I also took three targets with a green, white, and black t-shirt, so you can see the clothing color affects your point of aim while using this reticle as well. You'll see people using black targets like this black shirt to show that the chevron is good to go because it provides a nice large contrasting target, allowing you a good 300 point of aim, even with the reticle dimmed down a bit. If we hover over a white t-shirt, we can see our 300 point of aim pretty good, but it's a bit harder to know if we're actually dead center. We could be a bit high or low, and imagine if they were behind cover like our little green man was. Hovering over Ranger Green is a bit harder to exact our point of aim, even when out in the open. Jumping now to the ACSS Aurora, you can see that the Chevron will have all of the same disadvantages out to 300, but for some reason they decided to illuminate down the BDC even further. I'm not sure if this was by request or personal choice, but I have no idea why you would add blooming to the distances and minimize your likelihood of a low probability impact. At least the original Chevron had a 400 meter point of aim in black to take a precise shot, which we know works much better. Both the original Chevron and the ACSS Aurora also make it a bit harder to range estimate threats around the 300 area, and the Aurora decided to apply this to the 400. As I follow this target at 350 yards, you can see this Aurora bloom is just a mess. The added illumination decreases what I can see in their hands as well as range estimation and taking a precise shot. This blooming may be seen again on a dark target in the open up close, but you'll again want to tape off the fiber illumination for everything else out to distance you do. It sounds like I also hate the Aurora, but I actually appreciate the wind hold options added to this model. If you live out west or in a wide open terrain, wind can be your worst enemy. Having wind corrections could be a priority and this is a great feature to have. It doesn't add too much clutter, but unfortunately it comes with the extended illumination down the BDC and the Chevron which does a disservice to the 200 and 300 meter aiming points. The military Chevron lacks the wind holds, but the Aurora adds blooming issues down the BDC which I just don't understand. You're not taking 400 meter shots in the dark. Speaking of the dark, I ran these reticles passively under night vision and again, the chevron is quite thick. The good news is that you can't see that far under night vision to shoot passively anyway, so the tip will serve you just fine in the rare instance that you practice this. I suggest taping off the reticle and letting the internal tritium take over in case you wander into a higher light level, blowing out your reticle. The OG chevron reticle I've owned and used the longest, almost 18 years or so, so it's not personal. It has a soft place in my heart actually, but this all changed about 5 years ago when I bought a few other reticles to try, like the horseshoe dot and the crosshair. If we take the official diagram of the horseshoe dot, you can see that the area that used to be restricted by the chevron has been opened up a bit. The problem we have at 300 isn't as restrictive and we can now take a better shot at our little green man. Don't base your reticle selection off of generous bright targets out in the open. Now if you turn off the LED model or tape off the fiber model back to a black reticle, your mid-range shots are that much easier compared to the chevron using this horseshoe dot reticle. It makes sense why the Marine Corps started issuing circle dot reticles like this one in the 3.5X SDO and MGO ACOGs for the M27. Not only does this model have a better eye relief, but the reticle was improved by adding additional points of aim for 700 out to 1000 meter targets in the event you run this on an M249. 
A few other interesting things about these models is the flat front unlike the standard TA-11 for a threaded kill flash adapter and flip caps included for weather conditions, but the reticle also has a slight deviation as the BDC goes further down. This was requested by the Marine Corps to compensate for spin drift of the M855 cartridge out the distance unique to these Marine Corps models. These also use a 0.1 mil adjustment for the dial since the Marine Corps is slowly transitioning to the mil system. But my other SDO or MGO ACOG has one quarter MOA adjustments for some reason. The website doesn't list this model anymore, so maybe one of you Marines out there can let me know in the comments why I have this oddball MOA model. Now this reticle is a little overkill in my opinion for 5.56 and only a 3.5x, so the standard horseshoe should do you just fine. I can't say I personally like this larger center dot because even at 200 you may have to take a low probability shot if someone is behind cover like our little green man. So far this reticle seems like an improvement upon the chevron except it doesn't have wind holds like the aurora from earlier. But wait, primary arms coming in strong with a horseshoe reticle that includes wind holds and an additional range estimation section. We get the extra space of the horseshoe with wind holds and range estimation. Targets won't always be facing towards you like our little green man, so a side profile may be all that's available. Range estimation is super important because in real life we won't have a convenient berm at a known distance to know which hold we need on the BDC. If we look down my street, can you guess how far someone would be next to this car? This is 305 yards from my position and maybe a side profile is all you'd get to make the correct hold. This ACSS reticle also has the 10 mile per hour wind holds removed, so you windy boys might have to use some Kentucky windage for stronger gusts of wind. My main gripe with this reticle is that the horseshoe shape isn't exactly the same dimensions as the Trijicon version, and this replaced the dot with a small chevron. This chevron is so small that it basically appears like a dot since we're focused on the target and not the reticle, so I'm not sure this helps besides having a slightly finer tip for a tight shot at 100 while black. This horseshoe ring is also a bit thick for my liking. I cannot stand thick reticles which risk obscuring your target view, which was the main gripe with the chevron. Even up close you can see that a thicker horseshoe ring provides no extra speed up close at the 10 foot, 15 yard, or 25 yard CQB distances. All this did was blur more of our 200 and 300 points of aim which has me shaking my head. Over our three color targets, this tighter space from the thicker horseshoe blooming blurs a bit more of our point of aim compared to the standard horseshoe, which is also a bit more spacious when it came to finding and targeting our threat behind cover. You'll definitely want to tape this model off as well when taking low probability shots. This reticle is also based in yards, which most Americans will find convenient since most ranges here are based in yardage. This is why the BDC below the Trijicon model is stretched out a bit. Meters are a longer unit of measurement than yards are, so the projectile at 400 meters will have dropped an elevation more than it has at 400 yards. If you use a meter-based reticle on a yardage range, you can make it work by truing in the meter reticle like I did in my truing the ACOG video. There is a chevron reticle based in yards using the M193 from Trijicon also, but let me tell you, of all the reticles I own, this one truly seems to be the most accurate as far as point of aim and point of impacts go. Not to mention the Trijicon M193 reticle is a freaking chevron only model. Under night vision, the horseshoe dot is quite a blooming disaster, so you want to tape them off including the slightly more congested ACSS. I will say I'm amazed every time how well my shots line up with the BDC using the ACSS so bravo to primary arms for this accuracy using yardage based ranges and partially ditching the chevron. So far the best reticle in my honest opinion but doesn't matter since it's discontinued. It's going to be okay because now we can jump to the final family of reticles, the crosshairs. Because I wanted the RMR combo ACOG, I eventually bought the TA31-D-100553 model which used to be called the ECOS. This specific one is a red crosshair, M4A1 slash M249 BDC out to 1000 meters similar to the Marine Corps SDO reticle we saw earlier. I liked it so much I picked up an original ECOS with a green crosshair off a friend who got over his ACOG attraction. This rare tanidized model has a crosshair reticle that is slightly different if you look closely at the center crosshair compared to the Gen 2 ECOS. The illumination is not as wide on the 100 meter crosshair, as well as a small difference in the secondary illumination, but it's basically the same. Under night vision you can see the difference in illumination shape and if we turn them down a bit you can really see the difference in the section that's illuminated. Both of these have the same extended subtensions for 700 through 1000 meters for area targets which is why they're open aiming points or surprise they'd cover the target at these distances, especially if they were a chevron. 
During day illumination, the green is again a bit too bright compared to red, so you might want to tape it off, even though you could still make a precise shot at 300. The blooming space between the 100 and 200 is a bit messy, but this 300 is still usable compared to some of the other reticle designs from earlier. On our shirt colors, we can make out a good point of aim on both reticles, but again, I recommend taping off the reticle if they become a low probability shot behind cover. I've only taken an egg cog out to 700 meters, which starts to get very hard depending on conditions, so later I picked up another crosshair, the TA31-CH-G, since I don't think using an egg cog out past 600 is very practical. I didn't say it's not possible because I've done it, I'd just rather have a whole different system for shooting out past 600 meters personally. I liked the simplicity of this one so much that I found a good price on the TA01 NSN ACOG, which has the same M4A1 crosshair design out to 600, but without any day illumination. These bad boys were purchased for SOCOM in 1995, around 12,000 of them to be exact, and got replaced eventually by the Fiber Chevron Model RCO for general issue to the Marine Corps and US Army. Old optics get forgotten about not because they suck or have been surpassed tenfold, but just because they're not new and hype. Yes, you can tape off the fiber crosshair model if you want to keep the illumination option and still run it black like the TA01. Better yet, you can even get the LED TA02 ACOG that has the crosshair, horseshoe, or chevron with the ability to adjust the brightness to any level you desire regardless of the lighting around you. Now that you know about the issues blooming can cause at distance, I didn't want to have to tape off my ACOGs all the time, so this seemed like the natural progression or regression to get a black only reticle. Not to mention the fiber on top is prone to damage like cracking and ripping over time, so I wanted this model to really beat up at the range, which is why I have two. This does have internal tritium to illuminate under low light conditions, which I actually find useful. And under night vision, the doll tritium only model doesn't risk blowing out on you if you wander into lit locations passively. This reticle stays thin the whole time if you don't want to deal with the tape or adjusting the LED knob. The usual blooming expansion from the previous models during the day is not an issue using this model. These .2 MOA bars allow you to use your 200 and 300 better than the previous models. Again, the main reason the ACOG rocks. Instead of learning your holds and hoping that day you got it right under pressure using a red dot, you can range estimate your target and use the super thin subtensions to take your low probability shot. You can see the blooming over our three color shirts isn't as bad with the crosshair dimmed down a bit. Regardless of color, it's pretty easy to know if your point of aim is dead center compared to all of the previous reticles. The black only TA01 is even better on these three color shirts. These .2 MOA crosshairs cover less than an inch on a target at 300 meters, giving it the absolute best point of aim of any of the reticle designs. You can practically see all of the target behind this reticle. This is where the reticle really shines. Let's go back to our little green man hiding behind the berm at 300 yards, in a ranger green shirt, wearing a ranger green hat to simulate a ballistic helmet. Let's suppose he's taking shots at you with only his head and shoulders available. Not only can you find them with this crystal clear glass while panning your area, but your reticle isn't blowing out, covering your point of aim like all the other models. I have the ability to shoot them in this 6x6 inch head box. Better yet, a 6 inch wide by 3 inch tall box since the hat represents a protective helmet. I have a tiny 3 inch window to eliminate this threat and this is truly where a black crosshair shines. A slow breath, exhale and slowly squeeze the trigger while focusing on your sight alignment on target. Impact. Let's run out and examine our shot. You can see it blew the hat slash helmet off from spalling because I impacted directly in the face under the helmet, the area that had no cover or armor protection. This was easy to achieve not only because these .2 MOA subtensions make it easy to zero at 25 meters, but also to confirm a center group at 300 meters to true in the BDC. Add in a good barrel, ammo, and practice, and you basically have a lightweight DMR. One shot where I needed it, and this is the type of advantage running a black crosshair can give you. Targets won't always be standing out in the open, giving you a nice and juicy minute of man area to target. You may only get just the arm and head beside a wall, or only a head and shoulders above cover. The ACOG, if properly zeroed and trued, will make these low precision shots out to 400 much easier. The crosshair is the best at doing this in my opinion. There's a reason long range shooters prefer thin black reticles. And not to mention, you can use your RMR up top or to the side for a true 1x reflex sight that will outperform any reticle design up close, even the chevron tip. Also, if we start out at the 500 meter berm and walk to 100, these non-illuminated BDC lines give you an accurate range estimation since there is no blooming. 
No, we don't have any way to range estimate from the side profile like the ACSS reticle, which is a bummer, but these thin crosshairs sure are crisp. Once they get to 300, you can see how well these lines are for range estimation unlike their illuminated counterparts. These shoulder width lines are dead on at 300 meters, just like they're supposed to be. People forget that in real life, we don't have known distances, so having a way to range estimate is crucial. Anything inside of 300 meters, you don't really need the precision unless, again, you're only working with a head peeking a corner or above a berm. This black reticle is also great for spotting hidden targets and concealment as well because the trees and shadows are your friend during movement. If this reticle was illuminated, you may have a hard time taking a shot at this target behind the tree. If the target was behind an obstructed position, it's nice to take an accurate point of aim. The major flaw this reticle has, as well as the others, is a lack of wind holds. I live in both open flat terrain and rolling hills, so it'd be nice to have windhold options like the ACSS and ACSS Aurora. Shooting out west or in the open plains almost demands to have an ACOG for windhold corrections to make these kind of first shot impacts. None of the crosshair models offer windholds, nor do the horseshoe dot unless you include the original ACSS to be a horseshoe dot like me. If windholds are critical for you, you'll have to find these rare discontinued gems on the secondhand market because they're not only discontinued, but they're only available in the 4X model. This basically narrows it down to a non-ACSS model unless Primary Arms or some other company does another collaboration project with Trijicon. Until then, I'd recommend either the Red Horseshoe Dot or a Red Cross Heretical, which both can be bought in the 3.5X models if you like the longer eye relief, or the 4X model if you're a Chad. I personally would give the edge to the crosshair. This reticle is available in all illumination types if you're not hip to the black only model. This isn't a CQB optic, so prioritize the reticle that complements the capabilities of this little beast, even though it doesn't have wind holds. Outside of a shooting range, this reticle is quite the delight, whether in a city environment with information overload, searching through construction or destruction zones filled with hiding spots, or even out in the sticks, you'll have one nice reticle to cover the task at distance. If you're worried about the bad 1X, add a frickin' dot to it, which now that you know which model to get and which reticle to get, Top Mounted vs. Candid Dots is up next. Thanks for watching and thanks to everyone who bought a copy of my low ammo training handbook for beginners. I freaking love you and if you don't buy one, the link is in the description if you want to love me back.